newspaper, Sir Wilfred. Oh, thank you, Mays. What do you offer? Uh, the Regina Leader, Sir Wilfred, the, the Medicine Hat News, and the Calgary Herald. All with accounts of the ceremonies at Edmonton. A day of sunshine, Mays. A day to ratify the title, Sunny Alberta. Not according to the Calgary Herald, Sir Wilfred. The Herald. Uh, headline. Alberta declared a province and Lieutenant Governor Boulier sworn in mid great applause. Seems accurate even for a conservative paper. <laughs> there is a second headline. Oh. Inaugural ceremonies declared to have been celebrated with three inches of snow. <laughs> the choice of Edmonton as capital has not been popular in Calgary. Some might think it unwise of Calgary to have sent a conservative member of parliament to Ottawa when a liberal government was choosing the capital. <laughs> A cynic might suppose that, though of course we know it had no influence on the decision. Of course, no bearing whatsoever. <laughs> Inaugural ceremony celebrated with three inches of snow. Perhaps the three inches of snow were intended as a joke. Oh, there's no doubt this weather report could be seen as humorous by inhabitants of the Wild West. But I believe that sentiments ran deeper than that. I'm informed that when the choice was announced, the Edmonton baseball team promptly changed their name to the Capitals. This caused increased attendance when the Capitals went to Calgary to play. The local sporting crowd turned out in numbers to heap abuse on their northern rivals. Well, when you draft my letter of appreciation to the mayor of Edmonton, I make special mention of the benevolent son. Of course. Oh, and I must send a note to uh, Mr. Picard, the northern trader. The man with the white vest and the two little boys. He begged leave to introduce them, Robert and Laurier. I asked Mr. Picard if it was my honor to have the fine little Laurier named for me. Oh, yes, he said, because his big brother is Robert. Then he explained that when big brother arrived, Madame Picard announced that he would be named Robert. Robert? But why Robert? No Picard has been named Robert. Raoul, Martin, or Jean-Louis are fine names. No, no, it must be Robert. But why Robert? Because. So, Father La Marchand baptized him Robert. And then the plot was revealed. <laughs> Though Mr. Picard is liberal, Madame is conservative. She had named Robert for Sir Robert Borden, leader of the opposition. <laughs> Madame Picard may not have the vote, but she scored one for the Conservatives. Mr. Picard agreed. That was a fine joke, but the next shall be Laurier. <laughs> I must ask his permission to tell his story. I shall draft a letter to Mr. Picard. Oh, and uh, with a copy to Sir Robert Borden. As you wish, <laughs> 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 Now there is a school. Is it possible I'm seeing the same school over and over? It pops up everywhere. It's dark and solitary in its own patch of prairie. Wooden walls flatten squares the land around it, enclosing a single room. Three windows along each side. A high-pitched roof, and attached to the front an entry like a miniature of the school. The sign says, Rolling Hill School. It would seem the hills are rolled out rather flat. <laughs> Residents of this community are proud of their school, for it has a belfry. It seems abandoned there, but Tuesday morning, when this weekend of celebrations has passed, it will be surrounded by children. And the horses they have driven in from the farms will be tied up in that patch of woods. Those woods, no doubt, will feed the stove when winter comes down from the north. There is more to Rolling Hill School than meets the eye. Napoleon Bonaparte once observed that public instruction should be the first object of government. It would seem the settlers of these prairies would agree with Napoleon. Everywhere, local government begins with a school board. Edmonton, I was told, uh, elected school boards for eight years till residents felt need of a mayor, pound keeper, and other icons of municipal government. Everywhere, education has come first, except in Calgary. <laughs> What can you expect of a place that votes stubbornly conservative? <laughs> I have a special affection for the schools of Manitoba. And though I never attended one, it was because of them that I became Prime Minister of Canada. An unlikely story, perhaps, but nonetheless true. It began back in 1870. Uh, the province of Manitoba, like Alberta, came into being through an act of parliament. The act gave Catholics and Francophones a right to their own schools an arrangement which worked peacefully for 20 years till waves of settlers altered the balance of the population. 
And then the government of Manitoba abolished separate schools. This defiance of a federal law brought about shouting matches in Parliament. Members from Protestant Ontario cheering on the government of Manitoba. Uh, members from Quebec demanded that Ottawa enforce its own law. Twice Ottawa ordered Manitoba to restore separate schools. Twice Manitoba refused. The Manitoba schools question consumed many hours of Parliament's time, with the government unable to decide what to do about it. The Conservatives were in disarray. After the death of their old chief, Sir John A. Macdonald, uh, they were unable to agree on anything, even on who should head the party. As leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, I had the honor of opposing four prime ministers in five years. <laughs> An election was coming in 1896. And as the Manitoba schools question raged ad infinitum with no prospect of resolution, I sensed that it was the key to victory. I needed to gain 16 seats. To achieve that, I need only craft a policy which would commend itself to both sides of the debate. Friends said, not even the almighty could do that. I respectfully disagreed and crafted my policy in the form of a slogan, a rallying cry, a Canadian rallying cry. In the history of our American neighbors, their hearts have been stirred by rousing slogans, but I could not conceive of Canadians chanting, give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> my country right or wrong. Taxation without representation is tyranny. No. I developed a policy more in keeping with a national character. Education is a provincial responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Friends uh, said the slogan would win seats in Ontario. Protestants would be pleased that Manitoba could continue to torment the French Catholics, <laughs> but it would cause outrage in Quebec. I said, you watch and see. In Ontario, I gained four seats. In Quebec, to their astonishment, I gained 14. <laughs> they had missed the most important part. When education is a provincial responsibility, the Quebec system of Catholic schools is safe. And the Quebec Protestants liked it too, for it guaranteed their Protestant separate schools. I needed 16 seats to win. I gained 18 to become Prime Minister of Canada. But that is only the first part of the story. As the rage, or at least as the debate raged on, I thought of the fable of the wind and the sun and their contest to see who could make a man take off his coat. The wind blew and raged and threatened, and the man had only pulled his coat closer to him. And then the sun tried gentle warmth, and off came the coat. The conservatives had blown and raged and threatened, and the premier of Manitoba had only pulled his coat closer. So I tried the sunny way. I had no doubt Premier Greenway was tired of the fight and would welcome a way out. So, as Prime Minister, I proposed the sunny way. Manitoba would retain its public school system. Education is a provincial responsibility. But if Catholic parents wished, their children could remain for religious instruction after 3.30 in the afternoon. In a class where 10 or more were French, the teacher would be bilingual. There is wisdom in the old fables. Premier Greenway, that reasonable fellow, laid his coat aside. <laughs> Uh, the sun shines bright on the schools of Manitoba and on the party which I have the honor to lead. Some letters for your signature, Sir Wilson. Thank you, Mays. No, I was just thinking about education. No need to concern yourself with that, Sir Wilfred. Education, education is, is a, a provincial, provincial responsibility. <laughs> Let us all be grateful. Uh, but I was thinking that the Manitoba schools question has given Canada a national joke. Well, of course, the Canadian joke. And in Edmonton, I heard a new version of the Canadian joke. Did you? It concerns three men who are asked to write an essay about the camel. A Frenchman, an Irishman, and a Canadian. The Frenchman wrote about the camel in love. Of course. The Irishman wrote about the camel in the fight for Ireland's freedom. Of course. The Canadian wrote about the camel. A federal or provincial responsibility. <laughs> Matter. How may I respond to the Canadian Club of Hamilton? They have requested the honor of your presence as a speaker on a date convenient to you. As you know, I have great affection for the Canadian clubs. Uh, please check my engagements and see if I can accommodate Hamilton before Parliament sits next. As you wish, sir. Canadian.
Canadian clubs are springing up all over the country. It was at the Canadian Club of Ottawa that I made my prediction about the 20th century. My exact words were these. The 19th century belonged to the United States. I think we can claim that Canada will fill the 20th. Cautious lawyers' words, I, I admit. But happily, they have been paraphrased to declare that 20th century belongs to Canada. 20th century belongs to Canada. It is more than a slogan. It is a, a message perhaps more inspiring than education is a provincial responsibility. <laughs> there is something so very Canadian about Canadian clubs. In the United States of America, there are no American clubs. No Italian clubs in Italy. There are German clubs in Canada, but none in Germany. Scotland is self-explanatory. <laughs> so is the Scotchman, even if you don't know what he's saying. Canada is the only place in the world that needs to be explained, even to those who are born here. I say that because becoming Canadian was a journey for me, even though I was born in the Quebec village of saint Lin. When I was 10 years old, my father decided that I should be as fluent in English as in French, and arranged that I attend school at New Glasgow, a town seven miles distant, which had been founded by immigrants from Scotland. For two years, I attended school that spoke English only, and lived with an English-speaking family, who to me are still like my own family. Yes, unlike my Great predecessor, Sir John A. Macdonald, who was obliged to leave school at age 15, I was able to go on to Collège L'Assomption and to university at McGill. At McGill, I learned the art of debate in either language. I love debate. And uh, developed the art from the fable of the wind and the sun to the closing arguments. I would be sunny and courteous to my opponents, even deferential. Their coats would come off, their ties would loosen, and then I would turn on the wind. <laughs> the art of debate has served me well, and I have been accorded the title Silver-Tongued Orator, though not always as a compliment. <laughs> After I graduated from McGill with a degree in law, I set up practice in a small town in Quebec, and was also editor of the local newspaper. I was not yet Canadian. Confederation was a consuming issue of the time. I opposed it. Confederation will be, uh, I warned my readers, Confederation will be the tomb of the French race and the ruin of Lower Canada. As you know, Confederation occurred despite my objections, and a good thing too, because I quickly realized that I had been mistaken. So much so that in 1874, I left my seat in Quebec Assembly to run for Parliament and have ever since been a proud member of that institution. I remember back in 1885, I traveled to Toronto to explain my view of Canada to the Young Men's Liberal Club of that city. In that year, the Canadian Pacific Railway was nearly complete, and I was on the verge of becoming leader of the Liberal Party and official opposition. I told them, we are Canadians. We may be French in origin, I pride myself on it. We may be English or Scotch or whatever it may be, but we are Canadians. One in aim and purpose. Below the island of Montreal, the waters from the Ottawa River unite with the waters that come from the Western Lakes. But uniting, they do not mix. They run parallel, separate, distinguishable, and yet are one stream flowing within the same banks of the mighty St. Lawrence, rolling on toward the sea, bearing the commerce of the nation upon its bosom. A perfect image of our nation. minister nine years ago, I felt the time had come to put the stamp of Canadian nationality on these lands that stretch from Manitoba to the Rocky Mountains. The Canadian Pacific was supposed to do that, but it was soon apparent that it was merely placing the stamp of the CPR, CPR on these lands. The last spike, which Lord Strathcona drove in in 1885, was literally the last spike. Mm -hmm. The CPR had no interest in anything beyond sight of its main line. But if we were to attract enterprising settlers to fill these endless lands, we must offer them railways. My government has subsidized local lines in Manitoba, laid down by the Canadian Northern. The new provinces have power to charter railways. Mr. Rutherford, the premier designate of Alberta, will campaign on a platform of the three R's. 
Rutherford, railroads, and reliability. <laughs> but for all those who settle these lands, my government has pledged 300 millions of dollars to a second transcontinental railway, the Grand Trunk Pacific. The Grand Trunk Pacific will give Western producers a direct link from Winnipeg to Quebec City to an ice-free port open to the Atlantic by passing the Great Lakes, Toronto, and Montreal. It will also help the port of Quebec City regain the position it once held in days of sail before steamships in the Welland Canal. Crossing these prairies, it will travel the original route intended for the CPR through Edmonton and Jasper. Looking further westward, the Grand Trunk will roll to a port on the Pacific to be called Prince Rupert. And every eight to 12 miles, the track layers will create a new town. <clears throat> For your initial, Sir Wilfred, a revised schedule of ceremonies in Regina. And the conductor of our train advises that we shall arrive precisely on time. He, he lauds the efficiency of the CPR in these matters. The man who speaks well of the CPR, a rare bird on these prairies. No, oh, indeed, Sir Wilfred. Any event which contributes to human misery is deemed a responsibility of the CPR. The hens are not laying. Damn the CPR. The farmer's wife has run off with the hired hand. Damn the CPR. There's been an earthquake in Peru. Damn the CPR. <laughs> Guilty in all counts. In the court of public opinion, a tribunal from which there is no appeal. The Canadian Northern Railway has its critics as well, although dissatisfaction is confined to actual operation of the train. A distinct difference. The conductor advises me of the standing joke about the Canadian Northern. Here comes the engineer's dog. Oh, the train will be arriving shortly. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard no such evil of the Grand Trunk Pacific, but construction began only five days ago, and this happy condition may not last. I'm impressed by the fact that the new trains, or rather the new towns, will arrive in alphabetical order as the builders advance westward. They will establish new towns A through Z, then begin again at A. A unique concept. Well, at the moment, they're founding Arona, A-R-O-N-A, -A, Manitoba. We'll lay out towns to Zanita, then begin again with Atwater. Well, eventually, as the traveler of the train looks out his window and sees Artland, Butts, and Chauvin pass by, he will know that he has reached Alberta. <laughs> when he hears the conductor of his train call Riley, Chance, Tofield, Uncas, well, he will know that Edmonton is not far off. Uncas? Who or what, pray tell, is Uncas? <laughs> <laughs> A character in Last of the Mohicans, Sir Wolfram. As the Grand Trunk Pacific moves westward, I, I fear the builders will encounter a shortage of names, beginning with the letter U. We are committed to providing them with 300 millions of dollars. When dealing with the alphabet, they must fend for themselves. <laughs> a wise choice, if I may say so. I'm sure the arrangements uh, revised will be satisfactory. I shall convey your concurrence. scene from the cover of Canada West, the magazine we published to invite the world to fill the lands that stretch from Manitoba to the Rocky Mountains. It is a harvest scene, of course, always a harvest scene washed in gold, a symbol of the last best West, Canada's West, with room for homes for millions. To proclaim the good news to the world, I needed a Westerner, and Clifford Sifton of Winnipeg became the first cabinet minister from the West. Minister of the Interior. Sifton is a man of energy, industry, and enterprise. He soon established the Canada West magazine and had agents in Europe, the British Isles, and the United States. He placed advertisements in 6,000 American weekly newspapers and invited the editors and their families aboard special trains to see for themselves the last best West where any man over the age of 18 can own 160 acres of land by paying $10 and clearing 30 acres a year for three years. And see the opportunities listed here. Ranching, dairy, grain raising, fruit raising, mixed farming. In Edmonton, I met a Mr. George Ball, a gentleman who had abandoned the state of Kansas after hearing a talk by one of Sifton's agents. I asked Mr. Ball if he felt the agent was truthful, and the answer was yes. The agent had declared, 
The black dirt is so thick you can't touch bottom with a ten-foot pole. The first time Mr. Ball's wagon was trapped in the mud, he realized the salesman had not exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, in April of this year, Sifton resigned from the cabinet. A flare-up of the Manitoba schools question. He never appreciated my sunny solution to that problem. Uh, of course, uh, Sifton's crowd had been indignant that the Catholics got so much. But the uh, Quebec bishops had uh, been indignant that the Catholics got so little. But when Sifton heard that separate schools would be allowed in the new provinces, he abruptly resigned. Though I regretted Sifton's defection, I had the good fortune of an excellent replacement as Minister of the Interior and Salesman of the Last Best West, the Member for Parliament from Edmonton. No man knows better than Frank Oliver the endless emptiness of these prairies. Thirty years ago, he walked from Winnipeg to Edmonton beside a Red River cart which carried the press on which he would print Alberta's first newspaper, the Edmonton Bulletin. <laughs> on the discussions on which town should be capital of Alberta, Oliver's wise counsel was invaluable. <laughs> and speaking of my sunny compromise on Manitoba schools, my supporters have accorded me the title, The Great Conciliator. Mr. Barassa, the Quebec nationalist, scoffs at the title Great Conciliator, and behind my back calls me Waffling Willie. <laughs> because on discussion or difficult uh, decisions, I seem at times to lean this way, at times that. Uh, the tightrope walker, teetering high above a circus crowd, he knows the feeling of being Prime Minister of Canada. At the moment, I'm seeking sunny conciliation on a matter raised by the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Sir Joseph Chamberlain acknowledges that colonies become nations, but is determined to reorganize a modern empire, in which Canada will have a seat at the table, but Britain must forever sit at the head of the table. For my efforts to resolve this matter with goodwill on all sides, I am attacked in Ontario as anti-imperialist. In Quebec as not anti-imperialist enough, in Ontario as a traitor to the English, in Quebec as a traitor to the French. What can I say? I say I am none of these. I am a Canadian. Canada has been the inspiration of my life. I have had before me a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. A, policy, a true policy of Canadianism. A policy of moderation, of conciliation. Another harvest scene. Louis Riel should be here to see this. He was as much concerned for land claims of white settlers as those of his own people. Riel holds a special place in my life, though we met only once, in secret, in the house of a parish priest in rural Quebec. It was after the trouble at Red River. We had to meet in secret because he was in hiding, in fear for his life, a victim of injustice. He had been sent to Parliament by the electors of Red River, but was denied his seat because he was held responsible for the death of Thomas Scott, the Ontario Orangeman, even though no charge had ever been laid, nor ever would be. I was 29 when I met Riel. He was 26. I found him to be charismatic, informed on political matters. Only when the discussion turned to religion did he seem to lose all sense of reality. I left the house of the priest that night, knowing I must seek justice for Riel. I must attempt my first speech in Parliament in English. I argued, Riel is being robbed of his rights. Since Magna Carta, it has not been possible on British soil to rob a man of his liberty, his property, or his honor, except under the safeguard of law. Riel is being denied that safeguard. What were they fighting for, he and those brave men of Red River? All they wanted was to be treated like British subjects. If that be rebellion, where is the man among us who, if he had been with them, would not have been a rebel as they were? My speech was applauded on both sides of the house, but failed to win justice for Riel. He was paid to leave the country, paid in secret. Ten years later, he returned. Why would he come back? Because he was urged to come, not by his own people, but by the white settlers along the Saskatchewan River. 
Ottawa would not acknowledge their claims to the land they had cleared. All their requests had been ignored. So, four white men rode down to Montana and brought Rael back to help write another petition. I have read the document he prepared on behalf of the whites and of his own people. It is moderate, well-reasoned, with no hint of a mind unbalanced, but it was ignored with all the others. Riel, old fears flared up. His people rose in armed rebellion. He was tried for treason and sentenced to hang. His trial revived all the animosities which had divided Quebec and Ontario. On November 8th, 1885, the last spike was driven on the Canadian Pacific Railway. Eight days later, Riel was hanged. Quebec responded with rage, Ontario with glee. My response was dismay. We were attempting to unite conflicting elements into a nation. Would we ever succeed if the bond of union was to be revenge? When Parliament sat again, it was too late to seek justice for Riel. Ultimately, history will be his judge. But I could seek justice for his followers. Our prisons will filled with them. I told the House. I shall not allow my fellow countrymen, unfriended, undefended, unprotected, and unrepresented in this house, to be trampled underfoot by this government. I charge upon this government that it has for years ignored the just claims of the half-breeds of Saskatchewan. For years, these people have been petitioning the government, and always in vain. They have been goaded into the unfortunate course they have adopted. And if this rebellion be a crime, I say the responsibility for this crime weighs as heavily upon the government who caused the rebellion as upon those who engaged in it. All in all, I would regard the events in Red River in 1869 and 70 as a glorious page in our history. So why has the government allowed Real to be executed? The answer is obvious. They tried him for treason, and he was executed for the death of Thomas Scott. Riel should be here to see this. A telegram from the mayor of Regina, Sir Wolf. Uh, the telegraph, a necessary evil like the telephone. <laughs> the motor cars are an evil of which I have not been shown the necessity. And the appearance of that road beside the train will be a long while before motor cars travel in Saskatchewan. Are we in Saskatchewan? Indeed, Sir Wolf. We left Alberta a quarter of an hour ago. was our plan that you should not be obliged to go to Alberta at all. I know, Mays, that was kind. In our judgment, there was no need of two inauguration ceremonies. One should be sufficient for both provinces, and it would be sensibly in Regina, the capital of the Northwest Territories. And to my discredit, I endorse the plan. It was not regrettably endorsed by citizens of Edmonton, who complained mightily that they would see neither pomp nor circumstance, and no dignitaries would visit. Radcliffe was to be there. Indeed. Wherever Radcliffe travels on official duty, he represents the majesty of our justice system. Uh, but the hangman was not of sufficient stature to uh, satisfy Edmonton? In their discontent, they would not see the logic of our plan. Regina was capital of the Northwest Territories. All laws and regulations thereto governing the Northwest Territories had been promulgated in Regina. Was it not logical that the act enacting both provinces be proclaimed there? Quite apart from the fact that Regina is a depressingly long distance from Ottawa, and no one wanted to travel the additional 500 miles to Edmonton. Mm. Well, man does not live by logic alone. As you say, Sir Wilfred. On the matter of pomp and circumstance, we saw that the ceremony must be accompanied by spectacle, such as the musical ride of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police at the coronation of our present king. And the performance they gave, and the acclaim they received from the London crowds, made one proud to be Canadian. And where are the headquarters of the Mounted Police, and home of the musical ride? In Regina. Horses and riders could trot to the ceremony at a quarter of an hour at no expense to the federal treasury. Magnificent, May is magnificent. On the matter of the mandatory parade, we saw that that September 1st was a Monday. But ah, there would be a Labor Day parade on the Friday, the annual march of the trade unions. We would hand out flags and call it the inaugural parade. Hmm. An admirable plan in every respect. 
Though in order to commandeer the Labor Day parade, all events were moved to September 4th, which left September 1st open. <laughs> An opening for Edmonton which was quick to seize. Indeed, indeed. And most troubling was the way they went about it. Surely this, this alleged city with its alleged population of 7,000 should have known that it is improper to write direct to the Governor General and invite him to an unofficial party. There are protocols in place to shield the King's personal representative from such familiarity. Even more troubling, Lord Grey ignored the protocols as well. Yeah, and you were not uh, asked about it. Oh, on, on, on August 12th, there was only three weeks to prepare. We were informed of a telegram which had been dispatched to the Mayor of Edmonton. It will give their excellencies much pleasure to be present in Edmonton on September 1st. Which meant that we must also be in Edmonton. Along with the musical ride, at a cost to the Treasury of $20,000. I think we must uh, make allowance for General Grey. His father rendered Canada a great service at a crucial time in our history. I believe General Charles Grey was personal secretary to Queen Victoria. Mm. And a man of wide influence. When Canada was attempting to purchase from the Hudson's Bay Company their rights to the Northwest Territories, the company set a price of $5 million, five be uh, far beyond our means. General Grey was able to bring the price down to one and one-half millions. The fourth Earl appears popular in sporting circles. I am told it is his intention to present a challenge trophy for supremacy in rugby football. Hmm. I think we can safely anticipate that Lord Grey's Cup will be displayed in Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget uh, his predecessor, Lord Stanley, who presented a challenge trophy for ice hockey. Uh, and Lord Minto for lacrosse. Oh, yes. I was not sorry to see Lord Minto return to England. We were not compatible. And though we owe our visit to Edmonton to the fourth Earl Grey, we are indebted to the second Earl for our tea. Oh, indeed, Sir Wilfred. <laughs> it is said that when the second Earl was in China in service of the Empire, he had occasion to save a wealthy Chinese Mandarin from drowning. In gratitude, the Mandarin named his best tea for his rescuer. I shall have the tea sent in. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> I fear that Mays will not forgive the Governor General's intervention. But if he had not brought us to Edmonton, there would be nothing to reenact 100 years from now. <laughs> I wonder if they will reenact the scene in Strathcona. Our train was being switched to the tracks of the Edmonton, Yukon, and Pacific Railway for the final four and one half miles of our journey. A crowd had assembled. I got off and walked along the platform. No official reception had been planned, so a man known as Jeremiah the Poet, who also holds the honorary position of town drunk, assumed uh, this responsibility on behalf of his fellow citizens. He seized my hand and poured out a sincere though disjointed welcome. Voices from the crowd cried out, arrest him, take him away. But the poet cried in a louder voice, no, you shall not arrest him. He is the prime minister of this great dominion. <laughs> <laughs> 100 years from now, people will ask, where did this take place? Tell us where we may visit this historic site. Well, they can be told it was beside the Strathcona Hotel. <laughs> the station was on the south side of White Avenue. The platform, mere steps from the doors of the Strathcona Hotel, which doubtless will be there 100 years on. <laughs> We then completed our journey across the river uh, to a flat below the downtown buildings uh, where the Edmonton Yukon Pacific Railway expired. On this flat of land would occur the ceremonies proclaiming the province of Alberta. As the train slowed to a stop at the end of the line, I could see the fairground with the racetrack in the center. On the broad infield, troopers of the mounted police rehearsing a cavalry charge for the morrow. On the left, the grandstand, red, white, and blue, with flags and streamers of bunting. Facing the grandstand, a platform from which I would speak. Its roof, a huge crown in royal. Behind the grandstand, a grove of poplar trees with rows of white tents in military order, uh, pitched by the mounted police. Off to the right of the fairground, I noted a square brick chimney in a huddle of rough sheds and was informed that this was the municipal powerhouse. For an entire week, it was to provide free electricity to all householders so that their lights would shine in hours of darkness and make Edmonton the city of light. 
I thought, though did not say, that it was remarkably small for such a responsibility, and my fears increased when in the evening we were taken to the town above to see Jasper Avenue ablaze with glowing bulbs, red, white, and blue, from the Cecil Hotel of the West, the Cecil Hotel is the city's newest and smartest address, <laughs> to the Alberta Hotel on the east. The Alberta Hotel, at one corner, is a tower. It had been wrapped with uh, strings of red, white, and blue lights to represent a barber pole three stories high. The hotels were full. Visitors had swelled the population to what civic boosters claim to be the everyday population. In these prairie towns, they count each resident twice. <laughs> Visitors were being accommodated in churches, hallways, lofts of livery stables. The great fur warehouse of Reverion Frères served as a dormitory for hundreds. Many families uh, drove in from their farms and camped uh, in the woods, which are everywhere at hand, pitching tents beside the farm wagons which had brought them. I shared a bond with these people. Our official party were to sleep aboard the train which had brought us. I was introduced to many citizens, including Mr. Oxner, who has a brewery. Mr. Oxner is German and was in a state of excitement. The place is all lit up with licorice lights, he declared, with licorice lights and everything. It would seem that the burden of so many electric lights must doom the machinery of the powerhouse to expire, <laughs> like the Edmonton Yukon Pacific Railway. <laughs> Eventually, we retired uh, to our train at the terminus of this railway with the reverberating name. Throughout the late evening, sounds of revelry came down to us. At midnight in the first minutes of September 1st, church bells began to chime. The great fire bell, which called volunteer firemen to action, set up a furious clang. And then suddenly, an explosion echoed off the valley cliffs, followed by another. The bangs were coming from a nearby vegetable garden. Mays made it his duty to investigate and came back to report that it was the Irish. No, <laughs> no monuments were being blown up. Three Irishmen had decided that they could not wait for the official 21-gun salute, so had borrowed the Hudson's Bay Company signal cannon, bought gunpowder, and had their landlady make powder bags on her sewing machine. <laughs> the midnight salute was going slowly, because each time the tiny cannon was fired, it flipped over on its back. <laughs> on the morning of September 1st, the Governor General was up and about early, having been offered a, an informal drive around the few streets of the capital. Though he traveled incognito, wherever his carriage appeared, crowds recognized and applauded the king's representative, who had brushed aside protocol. After all, he had told the mayor it would give him much pleasure to be present in Edmonton on September 1st. Edmonton's main thoroughfare is unlike those of other capital cities. Jasper Avenue is paved with a rich black loam that lures farmers to the last best west. And on the east of this avenue, under a sky of uncompromising blue, the parade was forming. And the scene was alive with children. Girls in white dresses. Boys scrubbed uncomfortably clean in white shirts. <laughs> 900 children were being marshaled into marching formations. 300 little ones, too small for the walk, were being placed on wagons so that when the years make this day a bright far off memory, they can say, I was in the parade when Alberta became a province. <laughs> the parade moved between cheering crowds, waving flags from wooden sidewalks, through triumphal arches displaying sheaves of grain, the proud harvest of district farms, and mottos to inspire a young province, granary of the empire, sunny Alberta, God save the king. There was, however, a notable absentee from the cheering crowds, Radcliffe the hangman. By request of the mayor, Radcliffe's visit had been postponed, lest the hangman's mournful duty cast a shadow on the day. The parade had continued along the brow of the cliff, westward, for some distance, then back eastward on Jasper Avenue to McDougall Hill, then down the hill and on to the fairground. At the head of the parade, Mayor Mackenzie rode in a Red River cart of the fur trade, followed by elegant carriages with footmen in livery, carrying aldermen of the city and their ladies. The eternal sun reflected off the silk top hats of the aldermen, purchased new for the occasion, and reflected off the fine trappings of the horses and off the horns of the musicians. 
Uh, there was the band of the Canadian Mounted Rifles from Calgary, the Indian Boys Band from St. Albert, and the Strathcona Fire Brigade Band, in tribute to the day Strathcona had declared a truce in her competition with Edmonton. Commerce and industry were represented. There was a cigar factory, Mr. Oxner's Brewery, and a department store with the only motor car in the parade of horses. No fraternal organizations seemed to be missing. Uh, the <laughs> trade unions had gladly moved their march from Monday to Friday. And it was drawn to my attention with civic pride that the plumbers were among them. Only a year ago, Edmonton began a system of water lines, and already the plumbers have formed a union. <laughs> Noise was relentless as the sun, but above the noise floated voices of the future, children who never seemed to tire of the maple leaf forever. Eventually, the last of the march was streamed down the hill and onto the fairground, where a band was tuning to accompany the Monte Police musical ride, a moving spectacle in the literal and figurative sense. Thirty-four horses with riders in red jackets, united in the harmony of a common purpose, proclaiming a rich tradition in only three decades and on these prairies. One day one may suppose that crowds were claim the musical right down with flying machines. As high noon approached, we, the official party, took our places on the platform and felt the growing anticipation of the crowd. At 12 o'clock, the proclamation would be read and the fairground in which they stood and all the land for 300 miles south and 400 miles north would be the province of Alberta. The moment struck. The mounted police fired the official 21-gun salute, which sent wild echoes rolling off the bluffs which surrounded us. Uh, speeches followed. I had the honor of the last word. And then the sunny afternoon was given over to sporting events, with the spectators keenly aware of witnessing the first baseball game in the province of Alberta, and keenly delighted with the first lacrosse match in which Edmonton defeated Calgary four goals to none. <laughs> As the sun set behind the buildings of the Fur Trade Fort, the lights sprang up again, and attention turned to the events of the evening, patriotic rallies, church services, concerts, and the grand inaugural ball to be held in the hockey rink. On these prairies, the hockey rink is invariably the largest hall available. Edmonton's rink is a block from city center and displays a unique feature. Around the boards is a wire fence to protect uh, players from spectators. <laughs> by nine o'clock, the rough plank floor of the rink uh, was concealed by 800 dancers dressed in costumes of older capitals. The scene was one of bewildering beauty, someone said. The youth and beauty of Alberta made a pleasing spectacle, someone wrote. Wise men must believe what they see. Those young people saw what they believed in the rink, in the raw streets of their capital, in themselves to make even believers of the wise. The scene shone at its most brilliant when suddenly it turned to foggy twilight. Machinery of the gallant little powerhouse uh, was suffering under strain of too many nights of making a city of light. The consternation reigned. Then the admirable fellows who had kept the wheels turning all week coaxed their apparatus to one final effort. The lights blazed up and gave the revelers a fresh charge of energy. The words of the poet Byron came to mind. On with the dance, let joy be unconfined. No sleep till morn where youth and pleasure meet. Ah, the tea. Thank you, mates. The Governor General's compliments, Sir Wilfred. He has received a telegram from the Mayor of Edmonton. Oh. Some members of his city council wish to sue the Calgary Herald. <laughs> Over the three inches of snow, I presume? In all seriousness. In all seriousness, of course. On what grounds? Defamation, Sir Wilfred. Defamation. <laughs> they are doubtless on firm moral ground, but I fear their legal position is weak. Three inches of imaginary snow will scarcely meet the test of defamation. On a related matter, 
the mayor of Calgary is moving to form a union of Alberta municipalities. Oh, a logical move. He's invited all the mayors of the province to a meeting next month, except the mayor of Edmonton. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Uh, when the capital was announced, Frank Oliver's newspaper jeered at Calgary's discomfiture. It said, few passions are more desperate or vociferous than baffled greed. <laughs> but be of good cheer, Mays. We are safely out of Alberta. Not entirely, Sir Wilfred. His Excellency has been presented with a proposed Alberta Provincial Song. Oh. It has been put forth by Mr. Oliver's newspaper and offers new words to a familiar air. Yeah, an accepted practice. When our American neighbors declared their independence of His Majesty King George III, they retained the melody of God Save the King, and now sing, My country, tis of the sweet land of liberty. <laughs> Therefore, it is not inappropriate that rural Britannia become <laughs> Hail Alberta. <laughs> Hail Alberta. Alberta fair and grand, noblest province of our land. <laughs> Together now. <laughs> that the Alberta song is a provincial responsibility. <laughs> song <laughs> As I look back on three decades in public life, I accuse myself of but one discreditable act. I did not want to go to Edmonton. How can one justify not wanting to go to Edmonton? How can one atone for not wanting to go to Edmonton, this time most of all? I will return from this trip ten times more Canadian. I have imbibed the air, the spirit, and enthusiasm of the West. Having the honor of the last word at the inauguration ceremony, I hoped I might at least provide a speech worthy of the occasion, their occasion, achieved against the wishes of a conscientious civil service, with jovial complicity of the Governor General. How would I make amends to the citizens of Edmonton? The welcome they had accorded me, I must hand on to the multitudes who arrive daily over arduous journeys over sea and land. I must assure these newcomers that the 20th century that belongs to Canada belongs also to them. I must let them know that becoming Canadian is a journey, even for those who are born here. As I was being introduced, I thought of the young newspaper editor in Quebec who had opposed Confederation, warned his readers that the Confederation would cause the tomb of French race in the ruin of Lower Canada. I rose to speak. I raised my voice to reach the thousands who were present and the thousands who were on their way. I recall the first time in 1894 when I visited the tiny post of Edmonton. Agriculture, the mainstay of the settlers, was sorely depressed. There were no markets for crops. Even the best known centers of the West were straggling villages. Regina was royal in name only. Moose Jaw was not far removed from the primitive conditions its name implied. <laughs> Calgary made a brave start with the arrival of the railway in 1883 and then stood still. I hope I will not offend the pride of any citizens of Edmonton when I recall that I could count on the fingers of my two hands all the, all the buildings that constituted this town. How happy I am that now in the new capital of Alberta all is changed. When I look about me, upon the vast sea of upturned faces, I see the determination of a new province. I see calm resolution, courage, enthusiasm to face all difficulties, to settle all problems. In order to bring this new province to the standard we have set for it, we must have the hearty cooperation of all the people. 
of all the citizens of Alberta. We must have the cooperation of the old settlers and pioneers, the men of the old provinces, chiefly of the province of Ontario, who came here when the land was a desert and made the desert smile. We must have also the cooperation of the new citizens who have come from all parts of the world to give to Canada, to give to Alberta, the benefit of their individuality, of their energy, of their enterprise. Let me say to one and all of our new fellow countrymen that the Dominion of Canada is in one respect like the Kingdom of Heaven. Those who arrive at the 11th hour will be treated as fairly as those who have been in the fold for a long time. <laughs> what we have, we want to share with them. Our land, our laws, our civilization. Let them take the life of this country for themselves, whether it be municipal, provincial, or national. Let them be electors as well as citizens. We do not anticipate, nor do we expect, that they will forget the land of their origin. Let them look to the past, but also to the future. Let them look to the land of their ancestors, but let them look to the land of their children.